Good afternoon. On behalf of Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College, the Southern Foundation, we would like to welcome you to our annual scholarship honor reception. We want to thank you for being here. And we actually asked the ground crew at the college if they wouldn't mind putting up some blinds so we would not see what a beautiful day it is outside and that you have given up by being here today. But, uh, but when you look around the room, you'll see exactly why it is that we do what we do and why you do what you do. Uh, my name is Dave Allen and um, I not only believe in Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College, I'm a product of Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. I was a student here from 1988 through 1990 before transferring to Marshall. I began my radio career uh, before starting classes in the fall of 88 at Southern and my career has been wonderful and this past March I'm happy to say I celebrated my 25th year in radio and this August uh, will mark my 20th year as the morning host of WVW. Uh, it is the longest running morning show in the state of West Virginia and I like to kind of throw that out there because it's some, something I'm actually very proud of but I'm more proud of the fact that how I got to where I am it started at Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. And that's why I'm always happy to have the opportunity anytime I can to talk to folks about the college, to be a part of the college and the foundation. I always just jump at the opportunity to do that. Now, and to give you an idea of what this gathering is all about today, since the inception of the Vision 2020 Major Gifts Campaign back in 2006, over $1.4 million in scholarships have been distributed. And during the 2012-2013 academic year alone, 294 students received scholarships totaling $3,490 uh, $3, uh, and, and some odd cents. I mean, that is an amazing, amazing amount. I think we should give ourselves a big round of applause for being able to raise that money. That's, that's incredible. And look around this room and you will see students from all walks of life and in all age categories. That is why we do what we do. So we want to thank you all for coming today. At this time I would like to ask uh, Josh Van Hook, who is the pastor of the Word of Life Church, one of the great partners we have at Southern, to deliver our invocation. Let's bow for a word of prayer if we could. Father, we're so glad and we're so grateful for everyone that's here in this place today. Lord, we just ask your blessing to continue to rest upon this organization and this college, Lord, that they have uh, endeavored to continue to improve the lives of those in the West Virginia and the surrounding region. Lord, we ask that your blessing be upon the donors, the generous gifts that come in, Lord, would not be possible if it were not for the individuals that believe in this organization enough to be able to contribute. And Lord, we also ask your blessing upon those that have been fortunate enough to receive scholarships. Lord, I thank you for their hard work, dedication, their perseverance that would continue to press on. Lord, we know that you said that you would bless everything that we put our hand to. So, Lord, I ask that your blessing rest continually upon them, Lord, until they continue uh, their growth, their education, and their improvement. Lord, that they would improve their quality of life for them as well as their family. Lord, we would give you praise and glory for every good thing that happens in their lives as a result of what everything this organization as well as the whole kingdom of God could rest heavily and mightily upon them as individuals as well as this, this community. Lord, we thank you for it, and it's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Good afternoon. It's going to be a hard act to follow. I have a radio personality on my left and a preacher on my right over here. So bear with me, okay? And every once in a while, please say amen or something, if you will. <laughs> it's, it's an honor to be here today. It's uh, just a... Uh, thrill, uh, something we plan at when this thing is over with, we start planning for next year, and uh, just welcome uh, welcome you today, and just have a great time, and uh, please feel free to take pictures afterwards. We've shortened our program down, so that could happen at the end, so please feel free. I want to welcome you to the 5th Annual Southern West Virginia Community College Foundation Scholarship Reception. My name is Ron Lemon. I'm Vice President for Development here at Southern. And I must say I love my job. And you're thinking, well, why is he saying that? Well, just to my right here, you will see First Lady in West Virginia, and uh, First Lady of West Virginia and President of Southern, Joanne Jager Tomlin. I'm starting my 20th year at Southern, and I've worked 19 years for her. 
She's a visionary leader, a tireless advocate for education, a mother, a Christian, and the wife of Governor Earl Ray Tomlin. And that's a real quick bio for her. And the reason I say that is we at Southern have a very u unique situation as Joanne as president. And, and here's the evidence right here. I called her Joanne. I mean, that's how informal we are sometimes here. Her visionary leadership and work has assisted us in develop developing the Vision 2020 Major Gifts Campaign. And you all are a part of this because you received a scholarship. And as Dave said earlier, we've distributed over $1.4 million in scholarships. And I will match that total with any community college in the state of West Virginia. I think that's tremendous. And, and again, please, let's give ourselves a hand for that. And what we really do is invest in your education. So we want you to do well. And I challenge you today and work hard. Number one thing, work hard, get your rest. And most of all, I want to quote the late, great, deceased North Carolina State basketball coach, Jim Valvano, or as we call him, Jimmy V. He says, and, I, and if I see students in the, on the elevator in some of these buildings, I will say this quote, don't give up, don't ever, ever give up. Thank you and have a great day. And uh, I do want to uh, recognize some of our donors here today, and it's sort of a li list of donors and foundation members. And as I call your name, please stand and, and recognize these people. First of all, I want to recognize our foundation members. John Walker, please stand. Yes, and the donor, correct. And uh, in the far back there, Mark Moreski, please stand, Mark, if you will, with his family. Very good. Mark's a member of our foundation. He's also the treasurer. Uh, another donor I do want to uh, recognize is Sam and Dee Caporalis from Winston area. Uh, Beverly Rourke with the Logan Regional Medical Center Auxiliary. Barney and Jackie Fraser. And have I left anybody out? I, I apologize. And one thing I want to mention too about the about the foundation, the the the, the, uh, the staff and faculty and administration at the college here has given over a hundred thousand dollars to this major gift campaign. So that's that's a tremendous uh, 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 effort on their part. And uh, just uh, thank God for that that uh, ability to do so with, with great jobs. So thank you, have a great day, and we'll proceed on, Dave. And I'll add one other thing. Um, I don't think people realize maybe outside of the college, I know those within the college do the amount of hard work that Mr. Lemon puts on on behalf of the um, uh, of the foundation and representing Southern West Virginia Community Technical College. We're not going to clap you folks to death today, I promise, but how about a big hand for Mr. Ron Lemon because he just does a fantastic job. Our next speaker um, really deserves, I mean, all the praise in the world for doing what she has done. Jo Joanne Jager Tomlin assumed her duties as president of Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College on November 16, 1999 and became the 36th First Lady of the State of West Virginia on November the 15th, 2010. Uh, 31 years of service to the college, 13 years as president, making her the second highest ranking president of ser uh, in years of service in the state. Prior to becoming president, she served the college as vice president of economic and community development, held responsibilities for management of campus facilities, management of campus instructional programs, community relations, public relations, marketing, graphics, television services, human resources, continuing education, workforce development, fundraising, uh, the Small Business Development Center, a variety of special projects. She was an adjunct faculty member serving in the communications field uh, from 1978 through 1981. She moved to full-time faculty status in 1983, just prior to moving to administration. Now as First Lady, she promotes a variety of worthwhile causes, uh, including education, particularly the community and technical college that will train and prepare the future workforce of the great state of West Virginia. Uh, you may have heard of her husband, uh, she's been married to uh, 
Earl Ray. Yeah, uh, uh, to Governor Earl Ray Tomlin for 32 years. And other than her husband, her pride and joy is their son, Brent Jager Tomlin, a graduate student, Marshall majoring in healthcare management. And unlike yours truly, uh, you may not know this, she started before her education career in the field of media, and she was smart enough to get out of it and get something that pays a little bit more money. So would you please make welcome the First Lady of the State of West Virginia and Southern President Joanne Jager Tomlin. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. And I have to say, Dave Allen just told me that he spends more time at the college now than he does at the radio station. So we love Dave, and he's always he's great to the college, um, always ready to uh, give us some public relations on the radio, and WVOW has been a great partner for us. And Ron Lemon, of course, has been a tireless worker as we've raised money since 2006, and as well as our development staff that is here today. And I wanted to recognize them, Lola Lackey, our accountant, Tammy Mays, our program assistant. Where are you, Tammy? Raise your hand. <laughs> and Emma Baisden, who is executive assistant to the president and board of governors, who also works uh, with our foundation. We thank each of you for being present today. Your presence affirms the importance of the mission of Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College and the Southern West Virginia Community and Techn Community College Foundation. It bears witness to the fact that the important work of both these entities must continue so that you and other students will have access to meaningful education and significant opportunities. Because you know in today's world, you can't do much without a college education. The event today pro provides an opportunity for you students and the college community to thank scholarship donors. Putting a face to a name, our donors are an outstanding and exceptional group of people who are leaders in their own right, who are connected by their own beliefs and common recognition of the value of education and learning. These individuals are also unique in that they could send their resources elsewhere, but they choose to return them back to their own communities. They know that educating our own will only produce a better economy and a better way of life for our citizens. On behalf of the administration, faculty, staff, and students of Southern, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your compassion for students in this region. Our deepest thanks to members of the Southern West Virginia Community College Foundation and its executive board, Reverend George Costas, Elizabeth Costas, Eddie Canterbury, Mark Moreski, who, who's here today, Phyllis Ossetton and David Scott, and John Walker on our board. Giving of your time, talent, wisdom, and most of all, financial wisdom. Your work has grown our foundation into what was once a dream. These wonderful individuals give their financial resources, their time and talent, without asking for anything in return. Our 2020 Major Gifts Campaign began in 2006. It's warm in here today, isn't it? Whew. <laughs> it must be up here. <laughs> With a goal of $20 million by 2020. While many of our foundation members took a deep breath on such a mammoth project, they agreed to take the risk and give it a go. The effort was well worth the risk. Phase one of the campaign had a goal of $7 million to be reached by 2010. In just 18 months, the goal was reached. Phase two began in January of 2010 with a second goal, again, of an additional $7 million to be by 2015. Today, April 14th, 2013, we have surpassed $13 million with two years left to go. Throughout the course of our campaign, we have learned that Southern has many friends and that it is a well-respected institution. When asked, donors are more than willing to give. Our scholarship fund has nearly quadrupled since the inception of the campaign 
And our students will tell you that even at Southern's affordable rates, it is difficult for them and many of you here to find the resources to attend college. We hear stories and testimony from students who receive scholarships day after day, some of which you will hear this afternoon. Without a doubt, students will tell you that the Southern Foundation has been not only a lifesaver, but a life-altering gift. But all this great work does not happen, as I said, without a great staff and support in addition to our Foundation members. Our thanks also to members of our administration, our faculty and staff, who believe in our mission and who donate, donate through payroll deduction. And as Ron said, they have provided today more than $200,000 since the campaign began. Our thanks to the faculty who provide a quality education to our students and who are on the front line of their success. Southern is a leader in community college education in West Virginia. In 2010, we were named 14th in the nation of all community and technical colleges. Our allied health students continuously have high passage rate scores on licensure examinations. We have expanded our facilities and we will have the ded dedication and a ribbon cutting for our new 22,000 square foot state-of-the-art applied technology facility at our Williamson campus on April 16th, this Tuesday. With the help of the foundation, we have brought more than 14 new technical programs to this college in the last five years. And our Academy for Mine Training and Energy Technologies has trained more than 23,000 individuals for the energy industry since 2006. We believe it is up to all of us to do our part in securing a strong financial future for our children, our grandchildren, and our neighbors. Our donors make it possible for Southern to lead our district in responding to educational needs of employers and to assure that our students have the opportunity, the education, and the training to become a part of that future. I also want to say something about our guest speaker today, Mr. Tom Haywood. Tom has served as the chair of our Board of Governors for the past two years and has served on our board for four years. And he is a busy man in his own right, yet I believe and I know that he believes very strongly in this institution and the mission of community colleges in West Virginia and how important they are to the future of our state. And we thank you, Tom, for your service to our institution. We hope you will continue your support and for you the students who are the recipients of scholarships who are here today, we hope that you will realize that money has to come from somewhere in order for scholarships to form. When you are financially able, we hope that you will remember your day here today and that you will give back to this cause at some point in your future. And remember the wonderful people who helped you when you most needed it. Last but not least, we want you to be Southern's marketing tool for the future. Our deepest gratitude to each of you present today. We appreciate you more than words can express. Thank you. I just want to follow up on one thing that uh, President uh, Tomlin and First Lady Tomlin said um, about the ribbon cutting that's going to be uh, on the Williamson campus this Tuesday. There is a fellow by the name of Landau Eugene Murphy Jr. who is going to do the yeah. national anthem. So um, uh, Landau has graciously agreed to do that and we worked with his management folks to get him here. So uh, that's going to be at 2 o'clock. Uh, I think that's right, uh, around 2 o'clock on the Williamson campus of Southern. It's an impressive facility, so I know it's the middle of the work day for a lot of us, but if you have an opportunity, we'd like to have you come join us uh, uh, for that impressive facility, and, uh, and, and Landau is going to be there to do the national anthem. Uh, today's guest speaker is an exceptional 
individual. He wears several hats across the state. Uh, you may see him meeting about economic development in Welch, uh, at the Educational Alliance fundraising dinner at Marriott in Charleston, uh, at any of the local hospitals where he serves uh, on boards of directors. Uh, you see him at the Capitol talking with delegates and senators and Governor Tomlin and you'll frequently see him at Southern West Virginia Community Technical College where he has served on the Board of Governors for the past several years. He is now the Chairman of the Board of Governors of Southern. I'm proud to introduce our good friend and featured speaker, Mr. Tom Haywood, attorney at Bowles and Rice in Charleston. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Madam President, donors, students, scholarship earners, friends. It's a delight to be here. Thank you for having me here today and the chance to address and uh, address you briefly this afternoon on this beautiful day. I drove down from Charleston after church, the red bud's coming out, the, the trees are budding, and I show up here and I see a bunch of handsome men and beautiful women. Mainly what I see is a lot of pride and optimism about the future. That's what I see when I look out over this crowd, and it's very gratifying, and I want to thank the people who are most responsible are the students of all ages, who make tremendous sacrifices in your lives to do what you do to be a student almost without exception with lots of other responsibilities and challenges and the family members who support each of our students. You're the real heroes here today and for, for those of us who support the foundation today represents the flowering of what we have tried to achieve for so long to create a foundation that can provide scholarships that can support you who are willing to make the effort in some modest way onto your success that is what we are about at the board it's what the foundation is about and this is a very glorious day to celebrate that congratulations to all of you um, the, the, as I think back, the First Lady uh, and our President did address briefly uh, the statistics of the Foundation. I had the opportunity years ago to serve, uh, help with some strategic planning and facilitation of a board retreat. This was before I came on to the Board of Southern. Uh, this was at Stonewall Resort and uh, there was a vision of greatness. You see it behind me on the banner. It's very directly attributable to our President who has a vision of greatness and the ability to lead a group forward to achieve that. And the group sat down and said, what do we want to create at Southern? What is our vision? And it was a vision of greatness. It was a vision of being a world leader. And we have programs. We're training people from all over the world. We have excellence. We don't often think of ourselves that way. But let me tell you, everyone in this room and everyone in this community has the capacity for greatness on a worldwide basis. That was the vision. So we did various elements to that strategic plan. And one was we need to really create a large foundation and the board sat around and they came up with 20 million dollars by 2020 and at the time we had about zero everybody goes gulp uh, that was a pretty bold big vision but you know what happens when you set a bold vision and you set a goal for yourself it's amazing what you can accomplish and you've heard the results didn't know if it was possible there was no assurance when we set out on this journey that we would be able to raise monies to give $1.4 million to award 294 scholarships this year. But we did it because we had that powerful positive vision. And I want to talk a little bit today about, um, uh, I, I have had the opportunity and privilege, I live in Charleston, uh, I have the opportunity and privilege to work around the state and region. Uh, I'm a lawyer in private practice uh, and uh, have had opportunities over time. And I want to share some of the perspective that I have because one, one reality I think we all experience as West Virginians is the last 30 years have been pretty tough, right? We've all known hardship that unites every one of us in this room. We've all known tough times. We've all experienced loss. Um, I can remember Charleston was bigger when I was growing up there. Logan was bigger when you were growing up here. Um, I remember driving to Logan to watch high school basketball games. We always feared playing you guys. Um, but you had those narrow two-lane roads. And now we have this beautiful corridor that links us and connects us. And so I want to offer some perspective because I think it's awful easy as a West Virginian to think uh, that we can't achieve, that some of our greatest challenges are low expectations 
low self-esteem and low sense of the possible. I think that we fight that all the time. I want to tell you why I think we are at the beginning of a golden era for this state and each one of you and, and I, we're all going to participate in that and it's going to be very exciting. So you're sitting there saying, what has he been drinking? But let me tell you the basis for my optimism about where our state is and where it's going. And it's not all easy, folks, just like your journey to get you here today has not been easy, but I want to tell you why we should be very excited about our future in this state and in this region. So if you go back, I had the opportunity years ago to work in the governor's office under a former governor, Gaston Caperton, and I was his legal counsel for a period of time, and then I became his chief of staff. I had that opportunity. And that really gave me a perspective and an opportunity to see a lot of things going on at the state level. It was a tremendous opportunity for, for a young man, a young man or woman. Anyone would have that opportunity to work at that level. And so what did I see? You know, if you recall those days, they were pretty grim. So he takes office January 16, 1989. Uh, the state is essentially insolvent. Uh, we've, the first, we go in to the governor's office at that time, and uh, all the there's no furniture, there's no anything. There's a desk in the governor's office, and there's a red phone on the floor. And I remember, you know, Governor Caperton looked at me and said, what do you think happens if we pick up that phone? We said, well, you know, nuclear war might start. We didn't know what that was. But, but we were pretty much starting from scratch, and we really had to piece it together. Well, we learned some tough things about how bad a condition the state was in at the time. If you'll think back to those days, uh, the first piece of mail we got in the governor's office in 1989 was a notice from the gas company saying they're turning off the gas at the governor's mansion for failure to pay the bill for several months. Public employees were being turned away from doctors and hospitals because PEIA hadn't paid, you know, hadn't paid those payments for a long time. Income tax refunds hadn't been paid for a couple of years. And when we tallied it all up, we were about a half a billion dollars in debt. Uh, we just didn't have the money to do it all. So those were challenging times. We'd come through the boom of the early 80s, and then that had kind of collapsed. And we felt that here in this part of the state, certainly. But we set about at that time, and, and I want to tell you where we are today. So think about that. Think about where we were. Our state's credit rating was among the lowest in the nation. We really, really had a lot of broken systems. I characterize it as we were broke and broken. Um, but we had, we've had good leadership through several governors, constant leadership in the legislature that's rode in the same direction for over 20 years now with great fiscal discipline and leadership. Our governor, who through that time was Senate president and before that Senate finance chairman, was a key player in that, but he would be the first to say he wasn't the only player. But there were a lot of people who really, you know, we took time to pay our dues, to be disciplined and be focused with a positive vision about what we could be. So what's happened since that time? Workers' compensation at that time was a real disaster for the state. If you talk to any business, it was the number one boogeyman that we had. For and it had been that way for a long time. And, and really through a lot of hard work and leadership, we ended up ultimately privatizing workers' compensation, created Brick Street. Those premiums have fallen by 61%. We're now the seventh lowest state in the nation in terms of premiums, and what was a real impediment to business and to our economic success for so long no longer is. In fact, now it's a competitive advantage. Who would have thought? And that was because we set a course and we stuck to it and we've accomplished it. And you can go through. We, we had the issue with state jails and prisons. We're under court order to be shut down. We were ultimately able through vision and hard work and leadership to create a new prison system, new regional jails that met constitutional standards. Roads and bridges were falling down. We were able to really re-energize that whole effort. School building authority, we've built several hundred new schools with expansions all across the state, all with a real sense of discipline. And we've done it living within our means. And so now, today, the state has a, has a credit rating of double A plus. That puts us about the eighth highest state in the nation. So we actually are the envy of the nation. We, we have huge rainy day fund reserve funds. We have almost a billion dollars that we've tucked away for disasters and for other things. Most other states don't have anything near that compared to the size on a relative basis compared to their budget. 
We've got, we've got phenomenal infrastructure in place, and we really are a state that's on a move. Our, our unemployment, uh, challenging here in this part of the state, the coal industry faces tough times. I want to comment on that briefly. But our unemployment's below the national average, where it has been for several years now, after many decades of being above the national average. Uh, and we've got our budget under control. Now the reality is this is a very tough budget year in Charleston. The legislature just finished up at midnight last night. I'm also a lobbyist. This is a very happy day for me. It's over. 60 days are over. Um, and uh, so we have a tough budget. The budget still remains to be worked on by our senators and delegates and ultimately by our governor. They'll put that in place here in the next 10 days or so. So we're in a tough budget right now. The governor, consistent with living within our means, directed all state agencies to reduce their budget 7.5% and tighten their belts. We're going to live within our means. We're going to get through this. The good news is, as you go forward three, four, five years, next year is not quite as tight a budget, and then the budgets are projected to be pretty good thereafter. So we know we have about a two-year trough to kind of march through, but then we're going to march through it, and we're going to be just fine. So what else has happened? We've spent a lot of the last 20 years or so solving problems. What happened in this session? Now we're starting to put in place the building blocks for our future and creating opportunity. We're not just fixing potholes, folks. We're building new roads to success. The governor led with a major education reform bill. Very significant what that's going to mean in terms of transforming our public education system, K through 12. Huge new investment in early childhood learning and education, trying to make sure that each one of us gets a fair start right from the start. And we know we know our, our common human experience tells us how important those early years are. We now have scientific studies that tell us what it means for those first two, three, four years. A lot happens then that sets our course in life. We have the ability as a state to really be front and center there. Um, the, the, uh, now let's look, about, let's look around the state and see what's happening. So has anybody ever heard of the Marcellus and the Utica? We hadn't heard of those a few years ago, but these are oil and gas formations that are present in West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Marcellus runs up into New York. But we, uh, they are actually transforming our opportunities. So we've long been an energy state. I think we're going to long be an energy state. We have a very strong diversifying economy. But one of the things that's very exciting is the discovery of the Marcellus. So these fields have been known about for a long time. They're pretty deep in the ground. Uh, they're shale. So I don't know if anybody's seen this. I've actually seen a slice of shale from this field. And if I held it up, it'd be about six inches tall. Just to look, imagine about an inch thick. And that would weigh about five or six pounds. It'd be very heavy. It'd rip a hole in your pocket. And you look at it and you say, there's not any oil and gas in that. It looks like a pillar out of a, con out of a car parking garage. There's nothing in there, but that's what's actually this shale form. So they've known about this for a long time, but it's been in this really tight formation, and they just said, we can't produce it out of that formation. We know it's there, but we can't produce it. Well, two developments made that possible. One, horizontal drilling. So now we can go with modern technology a mile and a half down, make a right turn, and go another half mile with amazing precision, staying within about a half a meter uh, either way the whole time. So, so what that allows you to do is instead of just having one fracture point at the bottom of the well, you can create a lot of fracture points. And the other big uh, development was hydraulic fracturing. We've always fracked wells. You hear about this debate, fracturing, fracking. That's when you finally drill a well, you've got to pop it open at the top when you're done. You always have fractured wells. Hydraulic fracturing is simply what the name implies, using lots of water, and it's lots of water, to actually open these formations. So these two new developments in the last 10 years now permit us to open up these formations we've known about forever, but just drilled through, right? We've known them there. So now they know that the Marcellus field is the second largest oil and gas field in the world after Qatar and the Middle East second largest in the world. They also know that they also have what they call natural gas liquids, which are ethane, butane, propane, various things, including oil, and that they are the most abundant of anywhere they've seen anywhere in the U.S. or in the world right here in these formations. So now all of a sudden, if you think about what that means, uh, the United States last year became a net energy exporter for the first time in 63 years. This year we are projected as a nation to exceed the oil, oil production uh, in all time in the history of this country and the trend line is going just like this folks, just like this. And these are, this is oil and gas coming out of these for formations. And that's not even the best part. Ethane, 
uh, which is one of these liquids that comes out of these formations, ethane is the building block of the chemical industry. Uh, first, crack, everybody, anybody heard, read the newspaper, newspaper articles about crackers? Raise your hand so I've seen crackers, all discussion. These are not elves and little trees making Keebler crackers. This is not Nabisco. What's a cracker? The first cracker in the world, anybody want to guess where that was built? Clendenin, West Virginia, 1921. Union Carbide built it. There were six in the Kanawha Valley at one point. So what's a cracker and why are they here? Ethane is this liquid that if you crack it, it, it becomes ethylene oxide, which is the building block of the chemical industry and of jobs. And so the whole reason the chemical industry grew up in the Ohio and Kanawha River Valleys was because we had ethane-rich natural gas and we built this cracker. And now I'm going to do a real quick chemistry lesson. I'm really good at chemistry. So uh, 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 ethane is C2H6. Go back to your two carbon molecules and six hydrogens. But the trick is the two carbons have double bonds, two lines. A cracker breaks those two lines and you end up with CH3, CH3. You just, you understand, you can explain to your friends and family what a cracker is. Now that's what a cracker does. It costs two billion dollars, it's a big thing, it makes a lot of noise, it uses heat and pressure, and it cracks that C2H6 into CH3, CH3. And that is the building block of manufacturing and chemistry. That now is back in our region. The re whole reason the industry grew up here was because it was abundant. It moved to, it moved to Houston, Texas, and then it moved to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and the Middle East because it was more abundant over there. And now they discovered the most abundant ethane back here in our region. Round two, folks, it's coming. And so I think you will see some crackers. When these crackers come, understand that's exciting in and of itself because that's $2 billion of investments and lots of jobs. But the real prize is you're going to have 10, 20, 30, 40, half a billion dollar manufacturing and chemical plants grow up around it because now they can be fed again with this incredible substance called ethane, ethylene oxide. If you, if you live further north, a lot of the fields that are producing this, there are fields down here as far as Logan that produce this, the most prolific are up further north, north central and up in the Ohio River Valley. In Wheeling, West Virginia right now, which has faced a lot of challenges like every other part of the state, there are 10 new hotels under construction in and around Wheeling. Just think about that. Just think about what that means. So this is really happening. This is a whole new economy being built. Our law firm has just opened two new offices, one outside of Pittsburgh, one in Moundsville. We're opening one in Ohio soon. It's really recreating a new economy. So this is not just exciting things for getting gas out of the ground. Think about the renaissance of manufacturing in our country and in our region, and that's what's happening. Coal, people think coal is uh, perhaps, uh, it's a tough time for coal folks. It's a tough time. I've talked to some of you here. Almost all of us in this room have some direct association with coal. It's something we can be very proud of. It's tough right now, and if it weren't for the export market, we all know it'd be really tough. But I heard a presentation by the president of Consol Energy the other day, Nick Julius, and he had these long-term trend lines, and, and basically what they show is the production of coal is going to continue to increase dramatically over the next 30 to 50 years. It's percentage of the world en energy supply by all energy experts, even those who oppose coal, is projected to increase in a dramatic fashion. So what we see right now is actually temporary in terms of a slowdown, but I think what our excellence in coal mining and, and, and taking things out of the ground is going to continue to be a huge competitive advantage, and coal is here for the long term, folks, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's going to be an essential part of base load power for, for the nation, and what's exciting about coal is that what you can do with it in terms of carbon, carbon fiber, carbon foam, it is light, it is strong. I think we have only begun to explore the, the, the real wonders of coal in terms of its application. So I think we've got an exciting thing. We've got the new Boy Scout camp coming. Uh, is everybody aware? So we've got in, in, in Fayette County, 10,600 acres, $220 million of investment so far on their way to a billion. The first jamboree coming this summer, 40,000 Boy Scouts coming around. They've all got to do community service projects for five days. We're scrambling to try to figure out what they can do. They're going to be building trails everywhere. It's exciting. And then the first international jamboree in 2019, the first time that's been held in the United States for over 60 years also. 
lots of neat things happening. Economy diversifying, we've got a great and beautiful state. In a world that's becoming very crowded, we have unbelievable infrastructure, resource, and talented people. Our greatest, ta our greatest resource is our people. That's why education is so important. That's why training is so important. None of us comes into this world educated or trained to do anything. It's all an acquired skill. And that's why what we're doing here today is so important. And that's why what you're doing is so important. Um, the, the, I had a ch chance to work with the First Lady on uh, 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 Workforce Development uh, uh, Task Force a year ago. And one of the things that we learned, just thinking about community and technical colleges, the First Lady alluded to this, but if you think about the jobs of the future, where are they going to be? There's a lot of projections on this. They all say the same thing. Modest increase in jobs for uh, university graduates, loss of jobs for people without any skills, huge growth in jobs for people with technical skills such as you get here at a community and technical college. This is the path to opportunity and prosperity. What you are doing, what you're doing with your scholarships is going to position you better than anyone else to have good jobs and good opportunities for the rest of your life. It's important for our communities, but you should know that what we're doing here, what you're doing here, is going to propel you to success. Um, so I do, uh, Ron mentioned about never giving up and cited Jimmy Valvano. I'll, I'll cite Winston Churchill. Uh, I want to close with this thought as I think about the importance of not giving up. Um, you know, one, we, we're an employer. One of the things we look for, and I guarantee you every employer looks for, is evidence of work ethic and persistence. Uh, it's the biggest predictor of who will succeed. Really doesn't matter where you came from. Really doesn't matter what you did or what your parents did. If you work at things and stick to it, that's the biggest predictor of how you're going to succeed. That's what we try to look for as we hire. And that's what all employers look for. And I'm going to tell you, employers looking at people coming out of community and technical colleges know a couple things. Typically, many of you in this room, you have, a, you have 15 responsibilities besides going to school. <laughs> So you've already lived in the real world and done it and proved that you can make it. In an, in, so you've already demonstrated stick to -itiveness. That's a scientific term right there. stick to -itiveness, And that's very important in all that you'll do in life. And you learn that the longer you go through life, the more you learn how important that is. So this training experience makes you very valuable to employers. And I know it's going to be exciting. So Winston Churchill, I mentioned to him, I've been reading a lot about Winston Churchill. Uh, he's a fascinating fellow. I encourage you, if you have an interest to learn more about him. There were dark days in Western society. Um, uh, most in the world had given up Britain as well as Europe to the forces of Nazism uh, and thought it was only a matter of time. And he was the Lord of the he was the Lord of the Admiral or the uh, first Lord of the Navy, and then he became Prime Minister right after Chamberlain. And uh, he was he he saw long before others the, the challenges that Europe faced and what Hitler meant. And he was a bulldog, right? He kind of looked like a bulldog. He was a bulldog. And, uh, but he really was someone who very much, he was very eloquent, articulate, a very powerful, impressive leader, and probably made a personal difference in the outcome of history based on being where he was at that time. But he, he knew how, how grim it was. And he knew one of his most important things as a leader was to always have that message of hope and, and stick to itiveness. And so if you go on the internet, go home after this, and go on the internet, check out Winston Churchill's sayings, read his sayings. But a lot of them are about not giving up. And one of his great ones was he went back to Harrow, which was a school he went to as a boy. And uh, they were reciting uh, literature and so forth. And he was just there as a, as a guest. But then they invited him to speak. This is 1941, so this is really the darkest of the dark periods. You didn't know if, if England was going to be around in six months. It was grim. And they asked him, to, they said, would you come up and, and say a few words? And he got up and uh, he said, never, ever, 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 ever give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. And he sat down. <laughs> that was his speech. Think about that. Most important thing he could do. So it is a real pleasure to be here to celebrate your success. You do represent the flowering of our vision for Southern. I wish you great success. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, 
as we like to do each year when we, when we do this luncheon, we like to tell the stories of students at Southern West Virginia Community Technical College and those that have been helped through scholarships and through the foundation. Um, and everybody's got a story. But I, if you weren't here last year, I want you to pay particular attention to this, this person's story. If you would, would you please make welcome a recipient of scholarship money in the past, Southern graduate Beth Kinzer. Good afternoon, y'all. I'm not a student anymore. I'm an alumni, so I get to say that now. It hardly seems like a year's past since I stood here before such a distinguished group, and I remember it very well. I was so consumed with emotion that I could barely share my story with you. But that bittersweet chapter came to an end, allowing a whole new and exciting one to begin. Today, I am proud to address you as a Southern alumni and to say that I have literally been employed since leaving the Coalfield Jamboree on my graduation day, in my graduation outfit. I am sure that each of you recipients have a story to share. To some of you, the receipt of this scholarship may be your saving grace. After a long line of failed attempts at one thing or another, and for some of you, it's a new beginning, a clean slate. Your possibilities are endless. If I can express anything to you that you'll take with you, allow me to leave you with this. Nothing, nothing in life is free, and there are no accidents. You are exactly where God meant for you to be at this very moment in time. Before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew you. Because of someone else's selflessness, you are here today, and you have been given the power to change your life. You do not have to be a victim of circumstance. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a holler. It doesn't matter if you grew up on welfare. It doesn't matter if you only got one pair of shoes a year. You have the power to change that now. You are the author of the story of your life. Be thankful for the opportunities and the gifts that you've been given. And never ever forget that all good and perfect things come from above. Always remember where you come from and where you are now. And if the opportunity ever presents itself, and it will, don't miss out on a chance to give something back to someone in need and expect nothing in return. My defining moment came sometime late last August when my youngest son, who is in the back of the room, needed a car seat. I'm married to a good man who works hard every day and would gladly work overtime to see that either of my boys needed had what they needed, but I'm also, also am part of a blended family. And that's something that little girls don't plan for in their fairy tale lives that they dream up for themselves. So when you're in a blended family, you have prior obligations. But it hardly seems fair to complain about things you don't have when you're as blessed as you are. My children both have a wonderful grandmother and a wonderful set of grandparents that would have seen that, they, that he had a car seat if I went to them. But instead I went to my closet and I said, Lord, you know what Liam needs? He's outgrowing this car seat and he needs a car seat. And if you'll send me the people, I'll see that the money is spent on the car seat. That was on a Tuesday, I think. Well, that Friday, I made $99 exactly and a beeline to the Logan Walmart to purchase little Liam a car seat. And when I was showing it off, you would have thought it was a Rolls Royce because I did it. I did it because of someone else's selflessness gift to me. If I had to, I could support the two children that God has blessed me with. I didn't have to ask anybody. I didn't, I didn't have to be, feel like a charity case. And every time I turn around in that back seat and I look at him, I'm reminded of God's goodness and his promise that he will always provide our needs and that he will never see his children go without. And my children are living proof of that. He had a plan for me. And God's plan for me, even though it didn't seem like that at the time, was to prosper and to succeed. 
And in the cosmetology business, <clears throat> it's a slow start. You have to build your clientele unless you go to a place where you where Walmart or a, a chain. But I chose to go to a salon that is well established in West Virginia so I could continue my education through a hairdresser that's been in the business for a while. I am proud to say that I am slowly building a clientele and learning more than I ever thought I could learn in beauty school. I received a lot of criticism over my career choice. Beauticians have a hard way to go. But there's one particular statement that I still carry with me to this day. I don't know why you're so excited to be a beautician. It's not a real job anyway. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> it is a real job and people pay good money for the services that I provide. And I am blessed to do what I love to do every day because someone else gave to me so I could do that. And it's just, it's just really a domino effect because they gave to me, I give to my children, and it, it just works that way. And it's changed my life. I no longer feel... I'm proud of myself. I, I feel more self-sufficient. I feel more independent. And it has truly changed my life. It may not be a real job, but that real job paid for that car seat, paid for clothes, pays for birthday gifts, pays for a pretty good lot of things. And at this time in my life, I'm not in a position financially to give back just yet to this foundation. But I will never forget what they have done for me. And when the time comes that I am, I will, I will gladly give back in some form to help someone else. But you can find me in Logan County, happily bartering, and it is up to code by the West Virginia state law. I will gladly accept a bag of baby clothes for a haircut <laughs> or something else that will benefit my children. I have done it and people laugh at me, but I don't care. It helps me and it helps someone else. I do this because somebody once helped me out the way that somebody's helping everybody in this room. And if you really want to help someone out, they're quoting Churchill, I'm going to quote Clay Atkins. If you really want to help someone out, this is what you do. You don't let the chain of love end with you. God bless everyone in this room. And for those that may not be totally familiar with uh, Beth's story uh, and how she got to where she is now, it's included in your uh, the little magazine that we have there. And uh, it's truly amazing. This is the second year that she spoke. And if she'll come back again next year, I can't wait to hear what, to tell what you're going to tell us next year. So, uh, but Beth, we have something for you, if you would please come forward. We have a special award. This is the Believe, Achieve, Succeed Award presented to Beth Kinzer for outstanding service and dedication through Harmony 365 from Southern. So if you would, would you please accept this on behalf of Southern and the Southern Foundation? Thank you. Now you've got something to hang on that wall of your not real job, right? <laughs> There you go. You're not real diploma. That's, uh, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, our next speaker is going to speak on behalf of the academic community here. He is an associate professor and coordinator for mind management at Southern West Virginia Community Technical College. Would you please make welcome Bill Alderman. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to all of you for allowing me to attend this event today. I want to extend uh, congratulations to the recipients many of whom I look out and I see as my student and uh, anybody that knows me knows that that is my first priority here and that's what I'm all about is the student. Uh, but I want to say that I really appreciate what the donors do because without them uh, we wouldn't have the student and many of us may not be where we are today either. Um, I have worked in industry over 25 years and I, I was so lucky, blessed to have made a career change and came here 13 years ago. I, don't, I, I couldn't work for a better group of people. I couldn't work for a better leadership, vision, than what we have here at Southern. And that stems from uh, Joanne, as Ron said, we're comfortable enough to call her Joanne, she's President Tomlin, 
and our First Lady, but all the way up to our Board of Governors and their leadership, we have it. So we follow that plan. Without a plan, we wander around aimlessly and we wonder where we're going. So my message to you today, it talks about a plan. And I, I look out and I see many of my own students that can really branch off what Mr. Haywood said up here about work habits. Uh, Carmen can tell you, I mean, that, that's all they hear from me is establish a work habit. Uh, that's what it's all about. If you develop a good work habit and a good attitude and a good altitude within your attitude, you're going to go far. But without that good work habit, you're going to get left behind. We are in a competitive landscape now that is not only community driven, state driven, U.S., it's global. And our mining culture is, is on, on the edge of that. And yes, we have bad times, but as against what he said, Mr. Haywood, I look at what we have confronting us as an opportunity because air coal quality here in West Virginia and what we have with our energy sector building pre presents a brand new horizon for us because our quality of coal here is, is superior to that of other states and other nations. And with a great leadership and a plan, we can mine it accordingly. I want to instill a vision in those students to keep on doing what you, you've begun to do. I look out and again and I see many of whom work 40 hours a week and they take 18 hours of classes. That's a lot, that's a load. And it's all about time management and giving of yourself to have that, that vision and that goal, just like the college does, of having a dream to get where you want to go. Many of you are getting there. And you know, I I'm proud to say that I would put my students up against many other students at other colleges and even, even universities because they leave here with a skill set and a mindset that is superior to others from, where, from, from things I've heard from other colleges throughout our nation. And I see results throughout our state of our students and where they, they go into roles and they, they, very critical roles where they pr provide leadership and they have very important jobs and they function accordingly. They are prepared. So keep developing that skill set. Keep growing. Don't ever stop. You know, I have another, I have a saying of Amon that can't never do a thing. Doers do. Do something. Have that plan, that vision, and do it. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Because obviously, you can. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn this back over to Dave, and I don't want to take too much more of your time. I want to thank the donors again, because again, without them, without what Ron Lemon and Tammy Mays and Lola Lackey do here, I want to say one more thing that I, I don't want to let go by. There's never been a time that I've gone to Ron Lemon or any of these foundation uh, uh, employees of his and needed help for a student that they haven't found a way. Never is a concrete word. I have never had one time that they haven't helped. They find a way, even when they think they can't. They dig down deep and it's thanks to you that they find a way. And that may be that you may be that student in here with, that is the recipient of that one last time, that digging deep. So remember that as you're, you feel like you're running on empty in your life. Dig deep. There's something left. There's something in the reserve. Go get it like they do, like they gave to you, and go give it back like Beth Kinzer does and succeed in life. Thank you. about to wrap the program up today and I want to uh, mention a couple of donors that I failed to earlier. Uh, uh, Mr. Walker, John Walker is on our foundation. He, is, he and his wife Nancy both are uh, donors to the college so please give them a hand here, John. <clears throat> Another lady I failed to, to uh, recognize and as you get, get prepared for these meetings people come at you left and right and I apologize for this but Suzanne House uh, she's Chief of Staff for Guyan International, representative for the uh, Shell Family Scholarship. Thank you for uh, coming today. And another lady that I've worked with over several years, years and it's, uh, it's a really a touching story uh, with uh, Debbie Harless and the Carrie Ann Scott Scholarship through Madison Middle School. And she has uh, four students she'd like to introduce today. If you want to come on up here, Debbie, if you will. Come on up here if you want. Okay.
Thank you, Debbie. We're so blessed to have uh, a, a wide variety of scholarships all over uh, our, our area here. Uh, now I will, will ask it, uh, I will introduce the student and please stand and we'll, we'll hold our applause till the end. We have several students, so bear with me here. Uh, the Katiga Develop Scholarship. And another thing too, before I get into that, please take time and as you go home or sometime to look at this booklet we just recently published. It tells Beth's story, uh, uh, Justin Tomlin, some of the successes that we have here, Mary Harrison, and uh, some Appalachian Leadership uh, Academy students, and I believe Estel, I believe Estel Murray's daughters are in there. Jesse and Kate, Katie Murray. So please take time to look at this, if you will. Okay, Katiga Development Scholarship. It's also known as Richard D. Wood Scholarship. John Baisden and Mary Kay Fields. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and clap. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, let's do that, okay. I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Okay, the Hannah Lumber Scholar, Hannah, Hannah Lumber Company Scholarship, Kalina Ellis and Cody Sipple. Very good. Logan, Logan Coal Vendors Association Scholarship, Alexis P. Collier. Okay, evidently they've left. The Man Pick Pack Food Store Scholarship, Cody Gerald. The Party Resources Company Scholarship, Kirsten Duff, Duffy. Adam T. Moreski, all the way in the back there. Alex C. Moreski. Zachary Miller. Cassandra York. Shell Family Scholarship, Whitney Hall. Okay, now these are the uh, Southern Foundation Scholarships recipients. Brittany Avis. <laughs> Kayla Baisden. Mary J. Browning. <laughs> Tabitha Combs. <laughs> Ashley Curry. <laughs> and I'm a Facebook friend with Ashley, and I really get a kick about her posts about her uh, about her experiences here at Southern. Um, She's a hard-working gal. Uh, Angela Dials. Uh, Tamilia El Elkins. Did I pronounce that right? Ashley Dye. I may have mismarked there, I'm sorry. Monica Evans. Mon Mona Evans. Mona Evans, I'll get that right. Doris Frazier. <laughs> Carmen Hanna. <laughs> Christy Hensley. <laughs> Ariel Gerald. <laughs> Joshua May. Francis McNulty. Dennis Mead. William A. Merritt, also known as Drew. Deanna Miller. Jessica Minor.
Coral Queen. Nikki Rodigario. Linda Ross. Caleb Solver. Sonia Sharp. Amanda Turley. Emily Williams. Jasmine Workman. Okay, the White Foundation Scholarship Charity. Cross, cross office, I'm sorry. Back there she is. And William Zarian. That concludes my part of the program, and Dave will finish up here. He has a couple of things to do, but thank you so much for, the, for your attendance here today, and uh, God bless you, and I hope to see you next year. You notice how Ron, as he got to the last few names, was starting to hurry it up a little bit. Ron smells food. He's just like me. So uh, we're going we're gonna to have we're gonna wrap everything up here in just a couple moments. Uh, I did want to mention, and Ron, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this because I heard it on the radio and it has to be true, uh, that tomorrow is the deadline. Is that right? If you, are going to, if you are going to apply for a foundation scholarship, tomorrow is the deadline. So you need to make sure that you contact Ron, talk to him today or email or whatever because tomorrow is the deadline for that. Uh, before we close out the program, we have a very special gift. I'm going to ask our keynote speaker, Mr. Tom Haywood, if he'll come forward, please. And, sir, we hope that you'll accept this on behalf of Southern West Virginia Community Technical College and the Foundation. Thank you, Dave, very much. I Thank accept you. it with pride. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're going to ask uh, Josh Van Hook, if he would, to come back up and do our, uh, our benediction. And then we will, I uh, suppose, Mr. Lemon, open up the trough. Is that correct? All right, very much. Come on. Uh, we, uh, we're going to take pictures first. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get your hopes up. We're going to take pictures first. Then, then we'll, we'll eat some. Well, it seems today's theme has been persistence. You know, the Bible says, do not become weary in due season for, uh, or do not become weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And so, really in the kingdom of God, there is no grace for retreat or going backwards or to quit at all. And so the Bible says, he that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not even fit for the kingdom. So, I want to commend all of you on your hard work, dedication, and commitment. And I've heard somebody say that, you know, you don't have to be great in order to get started, but you do have to get started in order to be great. And so, uh, you can all make a, make a, uh, make a stamp make a mark in your generation and I believe God has called us all to do that so why don't we stand up as we as we pray and bless the food just to get some uh, blood flowing in your legs again I know it felt pretty good to stand up for me so let's pray father we thank you so much for this organization for southern for the donors and the students and everyone involved Lord what a honor and what a privilege it is to have uh, something like this this great in our community and we're glad to be a part of it so Lord I ask that your blessing over this entire activity today over the food as we're about to receive it and we give you praise Praise and thanks for it. All in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.